From the First Presbyterian Church of Atlanta, I'm Ryan Bonfilio, and this is TheoEd Talks. And I'm here with Reverend Dr. Brent A. Strawn in a follow-up conversation about your recent TheoEd Talks titled, The Greatest Story Never Told, Rethinking the Bible as Poetry. Dr. Strawn, it's great to have you here with us. Thanks for having me. So I'm really fascinated by your talk where you're challenging us to begin to think about the Bible not as a series of stories or even as one long story, mm. but rather you're asking us to think about the Bible as a poem or mm. a series of poems. Mm -hmm. um, but what strikes me about that is it seems so ingrained in us to think of the Bible as story. We talk about children's stories from the Bible and so on and so forth. There's narrative lectionaries. Mm. Why is it, do you think, that the idea that the Bible is a story is so ingrained in our understanding of Scripture? This is a great question, and I don't know if I have just the right answer, though I suspect it has a lot to do with how much we tell stories, and mm -hmm. even to children, so it gets ingrained in us early. I suspect it also has to do with a certain notion of temporal sequencing, mm -hmm. and that uh, we think, therefore, something that has a beginning and a middle and an end is a story, even when sometimes those things aren't stories. Yeah. Uh, poems have beginning, middle, and sure. ends as well. Yeah. So I suspect it has something to do with that, and a kind of then uh, application of those insights to everything, to see everything as story, even when it's not. Mm -hmm. And it even seems to me that there are story-like elements or narrative-like elements in poetry itself. I think of you know, Shakespeare or Homer's Iliad or something like right, that. Right. How do poems tell stories differently than narratives? Well, there, there is a, such a thing as, as narrative poetry and dramatic poetry alongside lyric poetry, at least as understood in the three uh, primary types of poetry mm -hmm. in, in Western understandings. Uh, the Bible's poetry doesn't fit into narrative poetry or dramatic poetry for a number of reasons, and that's why it's best to compare it to lyric poetry. But poets can tell stories or uh, maybe make narratives would be a better way mm -hmm. to put it, or can even make arguments, but they just do it differently than a mm -hmm. novelist would or a philosopher would, and they do it by stringing poems together in mm -hmm. what uh, we call poetic sequences or mm -hmm. lyric sequences. These can tell a kind of story or, or plot a kind of narrative or even make a kind of argument, but they do it in poetic ways, which yeah. means it's quite different than a novel with simple plot or character development or like an argument in a philosophical treatise. Sure. So, but one thing that strikes me about that, though, is that you know, I can imagine a, a modern poet or an ancient poet making a bunch of different poems and linking them together in some sort of lyrical sequence. But in the Bible, of course, we have many different authors mm. linking many different types of poems together. Mm. What sort of adjustment do you think we need to make when we read, say, the, the lyric poems that are collected in the Bible versus, you know, the collected poems of Shakespeare or something mm -hmm. like that, because it's, it's a difference between many authors and one author. Does that make a difference in how we read? I think it can. Of course, if we approach the Bible along the lines I'm suggesting, it suggests a kind of different orientation and expectation. Mm -hmm. uh, and it may be that we just think about the, po the poetry of the Bible or the Bible as poetry in this way, regardless of multiple yeah. authors. But I do think that it does suggest that we think differently about what we approach, namely that we won't don't find or encounter or expect a simple, coherent, mm. unfolding plot where everything sort of builds up to some climax with a little bit of falling action and all loose ends sure. are eventually tied up. Poetry just doesn't work in that way. And that's in part what makes poetry so beautiful, but also it makes poetry really hard to read. Yeah, I mean, I right. even remember being in you know, high school English classes right. and thinking it was really easy even to read the most difficult novels, but reading poetry, it just takes a long mm. time. It's mm. hard to grasp the meaning. I mean, are you in saying that then it, that we should think of the Bible as hard to read? If the Bible is indeed poetry and poetry is hard mm. to read, what, what's the implication there about how we engage scripture? Yeah, you're right. I, one of my favorite quotations about poetry is from Wendell Berry, the noted poet and agriculturalist, and he says that a great poem can neither be written or read in distraction. Hmm. So the best poetry calls out difficult strategies of composition, but also of reception and reading. And so thinking the Bible as poetry does create in a reader the expectation that this is not going to be as straightforward yeah. as it might otherwise seem. Same is true with poetry. I mean, so much depends on a red wheelbarrow, you yeah. know, that yeah. uh, William yeah. Carlos Williams yeah. says. What does that mean? I mean, yeah. on the one hand, it just means what it means, but there's all this other layer yeah. of right. significance that is part of that. And, and a reader who knows that the, that the poetry is thick, complicated, that it needs to be 
concentrated upon when it's read, that it, it can't be read in distraction, does yeah. suggest certain dispositions or had attitudes towards reading that, that will create, I think, uh, attention sure. and close concentration when people read. It, and I think it's just safe to say that the Bible is more complicated than, yeah. the, than the tweets people spend yeah. most of their time reading these days. Yeah, that seems right. And, 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 and it strikes me as a really challenging thing you're asking us to do because I, it feels like in so many ways we live in a very distracted or at least distractible mm. culture with mm. tweets and Facebook updates and all these different yeah. things. We have our phones. I have my phone on me right now, even in this interview. Uh, I texted you. <laughs> yes, I'll ask that question. Uh, but so we are, we're inclined to distraction. Mm. But if scripture is asking us, or, or poetry and scripture as poetry doesn't tolerate such distraction, I feel like that's a really challenging thing for us then as readers that we need to take on a different disposition with this text when we engage it. Definitely, and I think the key things are, are attention mm. and patience. Mm. Um, concentration, I think, would be part of that. Uh, but, but the kind of slow reading that would be the equivalent in the reading domain as, as the slow food movement or mm. something like that, yeah. that, that's what Scripture requires when it's thought about as thick, dense sure. literature, whether you call that poetry or something else. Yeah. Those sorts of habits of attention, patience, um, willingness to continue to come back to it, to try to figure it out. What, it, what does depend on a red wheelbarrow? That's right. Um, th that's, I think, the, 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 the challenge yeah. for readers of Scripture. Yeah, and it feels like it does something to us, even beyond the content mm -hmm. of this book, when we can cultivate that uh, discipline and willingness to concentrate. Right. Uh, th that, that's a really transformative thing, even in how we interact with others and interact with the world around us. I mean, it almost strikes me that, that any... Any student interested in the Bible, whether they be in seminary or divinity school or, or just an, an, uh, an average congregant or someone who attends synagogue, should probably take a course in poetry <laughs> yeah. if they really want to take yeah. the Bible seriously. I, so. I don't know if that's within your pay grade to institute that at yeah. Candler. <laughs> probably but. not, but I like that idea. And again, I, I think the, uh, the notion that when we read poetry, we're not necessarily reading a, a how-to manual. Yeah. We're not reading necessarily a novel where everything gets, gets wrapped up, but instead we're reading something something that might just capture our imaginations yeah. or that uh, we might be overcome That's by right. uh, or just delight in. Yeah. These, these are a range mm. of being taught and being persuaded and being instructed. These are kinds of a, a range of, of options that poetry can work on us that I think is a, a more lively genre yeah. than comparison than, than other types that we yeah. might think of. That seems right. And it, and it pushes back against kind of this, this one popular phrase, especially we, we encounter in certain Christian circles, is this idea that the Bible says it, I believe it, that settles it. As <laughs> right. if it's so simple that, that, right. that the Bible just says things as a, as a manual or as yeah. a story, yeah. gives certain instructions, we read it, we process it, we settle it, and then there's no conversation. But it seems that if Bible is poetry, yeah. the Bible might say things but it might unsettle as much as it settles yeah. in what it says. One of the key things about poetry, in fact, uh, a title of a, of a big popular textbook of poetry in the last century was how a poem means. Hmm. Not what a poem yeah. means, but how a poem means. So its effect is as important as, uh, and its affect, its emotional affect, is important as its content. Mm -hmm. uh, it's how a poem means is as yeah. important as what a poem means. So, yeah. so how scripture means mm -hmm. or how scripture says something yeah. is as significant as its content, yeah. as a propositional truth. A great poem cannot be paraphrased. A great poem has to be recited again. Yeah. And that's the way scripture is. You can paraphrase it, but then you don't have scripture anymore. You just have cliff notes. Yeah, that's yeah. right. And, and, and kind of the idea, like, what does a poem do? And not yeah. just how does it... That's how right. does it mean? And what does it do to us? What does it do for us? How does it uh, force us to think differently, even if it's not giving us kind of black and white answers of we do this, you do that, and here's how you think about X issue in society. It's yeah. really more evocative. It invites imagination in a way that, that maybe certain other genres don't do. Yeah, and for the pragmatically inclined, I mean, poetry does something every time it's read. Yeah. I, I talk about this in the, in the Theo Ed talk. Uh, that word comes from the Greek word poieo, to do or to make. So yeah, every time poetry yeah, is recited right. or re-uttered, it is, it is making, it is doing something, even if it's not doing it in kind of five simple sure. steps or seven habits of highly effective Christians. <laughs> <laughs> or readers of scripture. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. One other point in your talk that really caught my attention uh, is near the end you talk about how it's helpful. What, what, what does it do to us mm. when we think about the Bible as poetry? What does poetry do? And one of the points you make is about candor mm. and how 
poems can bring forth honesty, transparency, a certain raw, unmitigated, mm -hmm. unfiltered reality. Um, and it seems like that's an incredible power of poetry, but it also strikes me that the most candid parts of our sacred scriptures, the lament psalms, mm -hmm. for instance, mm -hmm. are the ones we hear the least. Mm -hmm. We hear the least in church services. Mm -hmm. uh, we reflect on the least, they're the, the least well-known. What is yeah. it about the candor of either scripture or poetry that, that's so unsettling? And why, why do we need to recapture that, that mm -hmm. candid nature of these texts? I'm not sure why it's, it's avoided so much in uh, formal worship settings. I suspect it has to do part with decorum hmm, and maybe sure. with uh, putting on a good face or a stiff upper lip. Uh, but it's clear to me that people who go to worship, just like those who don't go to worship, are quite comfortable with candor as they experience it all the time sure. in the music they That's listen right. to or the, yeah. the movies they watch or the TV shows they stream. So that sort of candor is widely accepted, even uh, reveled in in some cases in our society. Yeah. And the fact that it's avoided studiously in worship settings is really a, a condemnation of those worship settings yeah. rather than some sort of, you know, scoring points for the, uh, the, the nice guys or sure. the good team or something like that. Yeah. So I suspect it has to do partly with the quorum, partly with the fact that we worry about these raw emotions that they could, in fact, overcome us. Mm. Um, and that's in part the power of figurative language, metaphorical mm -hmm. language, that it, it, has an, it has a way and even maybe a goal to colonize the mind, mm. to take over mm -hmm. and become not just a simple metaphor image, but a macro metaphor yeah. that defines everything through it. Sure. That can be intimidating to people. Yeah. How do we, we balance this this lament mm -hmm. song, how do we keep it from becoming everything and just wallow in lament all day long? Well, partly you balance it with other psalms mm -hmm. that you are not the next all. Psalm. You read the yeah, next psalm. Right. And so the yeah. way to, to critique one metaphor image is by means yeah. of another image or metaphor. And that's why thinking about the Bible's lyric sequence helps yeah. us. Because here's a poem for Tuesday maybe Monday through yeah. Friday, but there's another one for yeah. Saturday. Well, and that's right, and that there's a certain logic to that sequencing of the mm. poem. I always think of Psalm 22 being one of the most chilling and candid mm. lament psalms, and then followed right by Psalm 23, yeah. the Lord is my shepherd, I shall yeah. not want. So I, yeah. I've wondered if, if in some composition of the Psalter that those two are lined up yeah. to be that intentional pairing yeah. to lead someone through the sequencing of the poem itself. Yeah, that's nice. Yeah, Psalm 88 is like this too. The, the most, the, the darkest, as it yeah. were, most depressing psalm is balanced by 89, which just begins to open up to yeah. some lighter phenomena, but it, it, it goes on from there. Yeah. So 89 knows 88's pretty down in the dumps. It can't be too chipper <laughs> yet. It can't be 23. <laughs> yeah. Well, Dr. Strawn, it's been a pleasure to talk with you about your TheoEd talk. We're grateful for you being here, and we hope everyone has a chance, if you haven't done so already, to tune in to Dr. Strawn's TheoEd talk. Thank Thanks you. a lot. Thanks for having me, Ryan.